Now, application layer protocols, which we discussed, uh, there are some three different layers. In the OSI, we call them as application layer in general in case of TCP IP, uh, which is going to create a session, defines the format, and then maintain the sessions. And there are some different protocols which we use in general, and each and every protocol have a specific ded dedicated job assigned for that. Now, let's try to understand or uh, discuss about these different kinds of protocols we have and what exactly they do and how they work exactly. Now, everyone know about this HTTP. We generally access web pages. So whenever you type any URL path, it's going to open up a web page and that web page will be opened by using some, some browsing software, some browser, web browser softwares. But the backend protocol, there is something called HTTP, which will allow you to access these web pages, hypertext transfer protocol. Okay. Now, even you can have something called HTTPS, now the only difference between this HTTP, HTTPS is now normal HTTP will have all the information will be in a clear text, which means uh, anyone can read that information if he captures your traffic. Now probably in case of HTTPS, it will be more in an encrypted text. Uh, most likely your banking sites or any any online payment kind of things, they, they generally secure your sites by encrypting all the information so that uh, it should not be read by anyone but at the end http uh, is going to allow you to access uh, web pages so there's a backend protocol called http and it works on port number 80. now similar way we have some other protocol like ftp protocol ftp is a protocol which is responsible for sending and receiving the files within your network so let's say when the when the user is sending a request to download some file to the server and the server is going to reply and they are sending and receiving some files. Maybe you are downloading some files from server or a normal file transfer uh, in both the directions. Uh, maybe you're direct downloading some directories or some files. And and that, that's what, you know, FTP protocol will take care of that. It allows you to send and receive the files from one machine to another machine. So for sending and receiving the files, there is a protocol called FTP, which will look after the things. Now there is something called Telnet protocol. Um, Telnet allows you to access the remote device. Like in the in the basic series, uh, we have seen that if you want to access a remote device, you don't need to go to the command line over there. We can just uh, type CMD and then I can type the IP address of the device and I can access the device remotely by sitting here. So maybe that is in my, in my LAN or it can be in a different location as well. So Telnet is an inbuilt protocol inside your TCP IP, which will allow you to access a remote device, a remote machine by sitting on my local machine. Now that's something what it will allow you to do. It works on port number 23 and it's a default application uh, inside your TCP IP. Now there is something called SMTP protocol, simple mail transfer protocol. Now this protocol is majorly responsible for sending and receiving the mails like uh, I'm sitting here accessing some Gmail, some kind of things. The request will go to the SNMP, the Gmail server, and the Gmail server is replying back. So it's like, you know, uh, your entire centralized storage uh, is the, your, all the mailboxes, everything is stored in your mail server. And then this SMTP protocol will allow you to uh, access those mails and send and receive some mails like that. Apart from that, there are some other protocols like IMAP, uh, POP3. These, these are the other kind of protocols which can be used uh, for, for general implementations. But in general, we call it as SMTP protocol, which is a TCP IP protocol again. Now, apart from that, there are some other protocols like uh, TFTP. Uh, TFTP protocol is used in, it's called as, uh, it's a type version of TFTP. It's a modified version. And the major thing is it is used for sending and receiving only files. And especially this is used if you are doing some backup restore of any specific configurations, especially in the Cisco IOS. If you are doing some backup of your IOS or backup of your configurations by using a backend TFTP protocol. Or uh, in case of Microsoft, if you are using some doing some remote installation services or uh, in 2012, they call as Windows deployment services where you can install the operating system from the LAN, uh, less like booting from the LAN, uh, the backend protocol which will allow you to do this job is TFTP. So Trivial File Transfer Protocol, uh, which is a UDP based. Again, UDP, TCP will be seeing that 
uh, more in detail in a separate section again in the later on topics now there is another protocol called SMTP, SM, SNMP. SNMP is Simple Network Management Protocol. Now, SNMP protocol is for specifically monitoring your network. So, monitoring network means, uh, let's take an example. You have a very big network in your company network. You got some plenty of uh, routers and then switches. And then you got a big floor and then you have all the switches connected here in the building. And then it's connecting to some router here and then that router is connecting to some ISP like that and it's, it's going to be a very big network now let's take an example there is a user connected here uh, that interface goes down so let's say the use the user complains that he's not able to access internet or he's not able to access the resources on the outside network or inside the LAN now there is some problem now there is a problem with the switch mostly the port number or uh, the specific port or it can be uh, something physical connectivity like that now normally we can have something called network management service where uh, there is a specific computer which is installed with some monitoring software which is going to give the logical topology of how the devices are connected just like we can see them on a packet tracer how they are connected similar to that one it can give some logical view of how the device are connected and in case if something goes wrong it's going to send some alert message to the network server about that failure and the administrator can see that message either it can send some alert messages on the server or it can even generate some email messages now that's what these monitoring tools are generally specifically for used in the production networks now we call them as network monitoring tools and the server where we install that particular software we call it as network management software uh, network management server and then and the backend protocol which will provide all this information is your snmp protocol now snmp protocol will gather the information of each and every device and it will provide the logical topology of how the device are connected so that in case if something goes down then it will generate an alert message so that the administrator will come to know about that particular failure immediately even it will provide you some information on the cpu resources of each and every device and the network uses um, network utilization or a bandwidth utilization kind of things as well so this is something really a uh, very useful tool in the production networks but at the end this all process in the back end is done by a protocol called snmp so the next protocol we have something called dns now dns stands for domain naming system or service it's going to resolve the fully qualified domain name with an ip address like take an example we are sitting here we are going to type www.yahoo.com request but in general the, the the devices they don't talk to each other based on the names like we are giving in the url path this is our url path or the URL path and then the request goes to the near ISP and the ISP is going to maintain a DNS server and this DNS server will have a mapping of the Yahoo server and what is the IP address of that particular Yahoo server and based on that it will forward the request to the internet on the internet it's going to find that particular IP address device and then it will it's going to provide information back to the ISP saying that okay you want this uh, naming convention or the naming okay so yahoo server and then it's going to send the reply and it's going to define what is the ip address of the server and then the request goes to the internet and then come back to the specific yahoo server and then it will reply back but exactly what dns server is going to do is dns server is going to maintain some database which has the name to ip address mapping just like we have in our telephone directories if you take if you take your normal mobile or telephone in that phone what we do is we generally add the number and that particular number is mapped with a specific name so whenever i want to speak to one of my friend i don't need to remember the number i don't need to memorize that i can simply search the name and i can simply uh, give an option called dial and once i give the dial option automatically it's not exit exactly dying to the name it's actually dying to the number because my mobile uh, directory is having the mapping of the name to ip address so that's what the same job DNS is going to do. Domain naming servers. It, it allows you to use the domain name rather than to specify an IP address. 
It maintains the database of IP addresses and the host names. So again, this is one more protocol which will allow you to resolve the host name into IP addresses. Now, there are some other protocols again. Um, I'm going to discuss some of the major protocols here. Like we have something called DHCP protocols. Now, DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Now, what exactly it is going to do is uh, it's going to dynamically assign an IP addresses to most of the all the host you can say now why why do we need uh, this dynamic ip addresses let's take an example in, in any organization let's say you have some 200 devices connected in the lan and probably going to each and every device assigning the ip addresses is not an easy job so we we're giving a manual ip addresses on each and every device is not an easy job and also you need to manually assign the ip address subnet mask default gateway and you have to tell who is the DNS server and so that the PC can send a request something not really scalable so normally what we can do is we can have a centralized DHCP server what I can do is I can configure something called centralized DHCP server and in that server I'm going to define all the range of the IP addresses I'm going to define what is the starting IP I should use what is the ending IP I should use and what is the default gateway address so that if any user want to go to router or outside the network what should be the default gateway and then i'm going to say what is the what is the dns server so that if any user want to resolve the host name to ip address and all this information will be forwarded to the dhcp server and the dhcp server job is to resolve or to to reply to the request like here if i power on my computer it's going to send a broadcast request to everyone it's going to generate a broadcast request saying that uh, is there anyone this is my mac address and it's going to ask that is there anyone who can assign me an ip address now all the devices will ignore those messages because they are not authorized to do that but the dhcp server is going to listen to those messages and it's going to see the range of the ip addresses and these parameters and it's going to reply back with the available ip address let's say there is an available ip of 1.5 it will assign the IP address of 192.168.1.5 to the client automatically. Now that's what we call as dynamically assigning the IP addresses or to the host. And not only that, we can also provide some gateway and DNS information also to the DHCP server. And if you have any changes to do in the future, we just go to the server and we can make changes easily. And also it is uh, scalable for big size networks. So we prefer to have some dynamic IP addresses for all the host except router. We don't, we don't want dynamic IP on the router because router should be a static IP. Except some servers, uh, maybe switches, we, may, we don't want to change the IP addresses. Some special devices like firewalls, uh, we use static IPs for them because we don't want to change the IPs in the next time when they reboot. So we prefer to have static IPs for all the special devices but mostly for all the end users like a normal computers we we always want to have them automatic ip addresses assigned to them so that's what job uh, dhcp is going to do now to to automatically work with the dhcp we just need to give this option obtain ip automatically and then this option is by default selected and obtain dns server automatically when i give this option whenever you power on the pc it's going to send a broadcast request in the LAN for requesting a IP address. If there is a DHCP server, you can get an IP address from the range and we can verify that in the command line by using IP configuration commands.